Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. As uh, we are going to get ready to basically do this, and of course my guest is going to say, oh no, no one has ever said that before. I want to tell you my secret now. I see dead people. <laughs> and that is the title of her book, and she is joining us here on the program today. It's great to have our guest with us, and I'm going to uh, ask you, if you would, to, uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce you by name here in just a moment, but first of all, you see dead people. That is the title, I should say, of her book. That is the title of her book, as uh, she has written, but it's not quite quite what you think folks it's not quite what you think donna frankart is my guest and uh, i want to thank you so much for being with us well richard thank you for having me it's my pleasure i uh, i'm sure that that has come up on more occasions than you would care to uh, think of uh, in terms of people thinking that they know what we're going to be talking about if they've never seen the book or read the bio information. All they heard was, I see dead people. Uh, and it's your personal diary uh, as a deputy coroner. Uh, and uh, I've heard the phrase from mostly television programs, but I've also watched some uh, re-dramatizations of certain events where a coroner or person who handles the autopsy has used the comment that they allow that person who is laying there on the table to speak to them through the investigation, through the autopsy and so forth, uh, but sometimes through gut. But by the same token, the reality is also that you have had supernatural experience as well, correct? That's correct. I had many uh, decedents that I was told by mediums because I was so compassionate at the scene and the decedents never lost the dignity and respect that each one um, should have received and should always receive. And so uh, many of them would attach to me. They'd follow me home. Most did not cross over my threshold, but there were some that did pay visits and did uh, attach to me throughout the years. And that's rather interesting because <clears throat> from uh, my experience in, in uh, some of the things I've been through, and I've never had an out of body or near death experience, uh, certainly never been through an autopsy, at least not in this lifetime. Uh, and of course, if I had been, well, guess what? We wouldn't be talking. But it is is something that I have experienced from the standpoint of life between lives. It, it's, it's a process that the Newton Institute ha uh, has. There are books out by a Dr. Newton uh, regarding life between lives or LBL. And, um, you know, it's, it's a fascinating discussion, and we're going to maybe touch upon that. But it talks about how many, we'll call them disembodied people, okay, who have transitioned out of the body, may stay earthbound for a period of days, weeks, months, as we calculate. And then uh, they then move on to the next level. And that's kind of what you're talking about, is following whatever happened to them to cause them to leave their bodies. Uh, they hang around and they don't just connect with you, don't just contact with you, but it sounds like they, they hang around you, kind of like following you around like a puppy dog. Yes. Um, again, I've been told uh, by mediums that right. many of the deaths like we're paged out on any um unwitnessed or suspicious death so it's usually some type of a tragedy it's not an unexpected death whether it's a homicide suicide car fatality drowning it's all very tragic endings and so i was told that many of these people they don't realize that they're dead or they don't know what to do or they're not ready to leave especially the young and so uh, I do have one in particular that I was told by a couple of mediums, a young guy between the ages of 18 and 22, 
that um, was very lonely. And because I was so, again, compassionate at his scene that he has attached to me and he's kind of following around where I go, but... It, it does have a little bit of the sixth sense sort of scenario uh, where the main character played by Tom Hanks does, does not realize his state. And I, I you know, if, if you haven't seen the movie, forgive me for spoiling it, but that's really what you're talking about is that these people, they are for whatever reason, just totally oblivious to what has just happened to their body. And they, they haven't made the connection yet, right? Yes, that's have my understanding. You, have you, or, or, or understanding, have you, through mediums or without, have you had any kind of actual communication with any of these disembodied individuals? Uh, I've had where they have, they have said things to me, um, I also have had one spirit that, which apparently they're not supposed to touch you, but this one had uh, written high on my back. So you could see it in red nail high. And I didn't realize it, but one of my sons, now my sons also experienced these spirits. So it's not like um, it was just something that I was, fa I'm fabricating or that, you know, I was surrounded by too much death and it was really getting to me. My sons were also experiencing these spirits. But uh, there was one day when I was at, it was in the summertime. So I had a tank top on and my son came through the kitchen, the back door and he said, who wrote high on your back? And I turned back at him and I said, what are you talking about? He said, here, let me take a picture. So he pulled out his cell phone. He took a picture of my back. And sure enough, the letters H and I were on my back. Now, that's the only time that I was physically touched. And I, that unnerved me because I thought, you know, I don't mind that you're hanging around me, but don't touch me. <laughs> you know, I draw the line there. Yeah. And I... I've been very lucky and blessed that uh, there's, it's always been good, good spirit, nothing that was harmful or seemed like it was an evil entity uh, because I was always very, uh, I pray a lot and oh, I, I treat. To, I wanted to ask you about your upbringing in, in that regard. How, how has this changed your perspective about death and dying. I, I prefer myself to use the word transitioning, but, uh, you know, same difference. How, how has this changed your perspective from your upbringing, from your, if I'm correct, Roman Catholic catechism and so forth? Right. In growing up, of course, as you said, I was uh, Catholic, raised Catholic. And so I always feared death, especially with the experiences that I'd had growing up in losing loved ones. I had an uncle that was murdered, um, another uncle that ultimately eventually died from, he, he had been mugged and stabbed and he lived for a little while, but anyhow, and other uh, people that I was very close to that were killed in car fatalities. And so death, it scared me. And I always thought that once you die, that's it. You're done. But through the years of being a deputy coroner and experiencing these spirits that had attached to me and other people in the death industry, now whether they admit it to anyone or not, I would say the majority have also experienced some type of connection with spirit. And then I realized that, you know, there is, I believe there is more to life, death, that's not the finality of it then, that there is more, whether your spirit and your energy, your soul continues on, uh, you transition, like you said, to the next realm. I absolutely 100%, 150% believe that that is the case. And so because of this, I don't fear death anymore. Mm. Even, even though I was on most deaths that were very gory and tragic right um it it was um it was actually a beautiful thing it brought families together as we're talking here and we're talking with uh donna frankart is that pronounced correctly frankart frankart 
Frank Hart. Frank Hart. Okay. Yes. Not the yes. Frank, but Frank. Frank Hart. Um, yes. Let me ask uh, in reference to your perspectives on death and dying, on uh, the afterlife. And again, I, uh, you and I come from the same background. Um, I was born and raised uh, Roman Catholic as well, Western Rite, as it were. Had exposure, of course, to the Eastern Rite Byzantine through my first wife, uh, 15 years. And um, you know, not a whole lot of difference other than uh, you can go to one mass uh, and go to the same mass in 10 years, and it's going to be the same, almost exactly, with the exception, of course, of maybe the liturgy or the the, the focus of the liturgy or the homily. A uh, very interesting process of understanding. We are taught that the saints, if you will, and we refer to even our our friends and family members who've passed on as saints. Uh, they're on the other side there. They're watching over us. We have guardian angels and all this kind of thing. And now you have, really, you do have firsthand experience of these entities these disembodied, if you will, uh, individuals. And the one thing that has always come to mind, uh, Adana, is that according to scripture, it says that it is appointed to, for every man once to die and then the judgment. And of course, I then say, okay, well, what the heck is this whole thing with Lazarus then? Was he really dead or not? And we won't go into that. That's, that, that's for another, another program. But it seems as though there's a, uh, an interesting series of events that happens long before the individual goes to judgment, because on the other side, if you will, there's no time, you know, there's no time. So have they been to the judgment already? And now they're, they're helping us, you know, what's your perspective on what's on the other side, if we want to call it that? Well, um, I do have a little bit of where conflict in my mind, not conflict, but I do obviously, of course, believe that there is more once you, you die, you pass on that transition. I do still believe in God. Mm -hmm. I pray. I do believe in the guardian, guardian angels. Mm -hmm. I have felt them around me. I have felt where their, their gentle touch. Now, again, with mediums, They've told me, because I thought it was spirits again touching me, and they told me that they, as in these mediums, that it could be the guardian angels. So I also, in answering your question, do know of someone that did experience a near-death experience. And he, like so many others, said how beautiful it was going down to this warmth and light and, and uh, transitioning to his loved ones that had already passed, passed away or were on the other side waiting to greet him. I did also take care of my mom in the last five months of her life. She moved in with me before she passed away uh, a year and a half ago. And so I was witnessing active dying. I'd never experienced that before. I'd had plenty of deaths, but never someone that was dying. And watching her talking to uh, family, loved ones that had already passed away years ago, mm -hmm. and I could feel them in the room. So I do believe there's life after death. As far as your question with judgment, I'm a little bit confused about that yet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, I've, uh, and I think we shared this uh, when we chatted before our program here today. Uh, I, I say this uh, with no disrespect to anybody who does believe in the judgment, but I, <clears throat> I have a hard time with that because um, of two perspectives that I have two answers that I would give to God. If indeed there is a day of judgment uh, one is there's nothing I can say or do that's going to change your mind. If I didn't meet up to your rules and regulations, um, you know, you're going to do with me what you will. You're God. Then the other side of it is you're omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. You knew what was going to happen. You set all of this up. So in reality, this is all on you, you know, but I'm a personal, I'm a believer in personal responsibility, a hundred percent. Uh, and uh, I will own every element of my life, every moment of my life. 
um, as they say, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because that's who I am today because of all of those things. And I think I'm a better person because I've learned from those things. Have you had the opportunity in any way, shape, or form through these experiences of yours um, to, to pick up on, and I guess you'd have to go through the mediums to pick up on this more than anything else, unless your intuition is kind of tied into this, where you get the sense from these disembodied individuals that, you know, oh, I, I now I see where I went wrong, or uh, now I know what I should have done, or this or that or the other thing. Uh, has there really, there hasn't really been any communication in that regard, has there? Just words here and there. There was an elderly lady that woke me up one night, and she said, I got a new headboard. <laughs> so that meant nothing to me. <laughs> and then I thought I was dreaming, right? Because maybe it woke me up from a deep sleep, but it was actually a dream. And so I lay there for a little while trying to go back to sleep. And she said it again. Well, then I went to a medium and, and without mentioning to him what was that this had happened, this tra had transpired, he told me there was an elderly lady that was trying to get a message through to me. She was very, she was an older German lady and she was very embarrassed because she hadn't planned on passing away that day and she did and she passed away in her bed and she was remodeling and her room was not completed and so she was embarrassed that she didn't have the headboard up. Now I'm, I felt bad because I couldn't remember, I mean there were so many deaths, but I have not had any spirit, uh, spirits that have actually had conversations with me they've shown up their faces they're still they're the whole shape silhouette like the dark figure mm -hmm. i've had faces show up i've had rotary phones ring i've had uh, music start playing the high on my back but never where i sat and had full conversations i have talked to the decedents and every decedent i would not when the room was full of law enforcement and family but you know once the investigation was completed and then i would say to that decedent that um i was very sorry that their life had ended that day but i was hoping that they were at peace and they weren't afraid and you know i'd have little conversations like that and and please rest in peace and um you know well we're talking I love about you Art, and we're talking about her latest book and that is uh I see dead people. I couldn't resist playing that little cut uh, from the movie Sixth Sense uh, at the front end of the program. Uh, we uh, also want to let you know that we are here Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., and now 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Wednesday mornings. We are streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We have podcasts at SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, and other locations you folks are reposting uh, our interviews to, and I thank you for doing that. Uh, we also are on YouTube where you can watch these interviews and you can uh, get to know our guests a little bit more personally by seeing them face to face, if you will, yours truly as well. Uh, so go to YouTube, subscribe, subscribe to the podcast or the video cast. We'd love to have you do that. And we'd also love to have your financial support if you can do so. You'd like, if you like what we're bringing you, if you like the content. We hope that you do, and we hope that you will support us financially. That's the reason why we have a PayPal and Patreon account. It's for your security as well as ours. And we also encourage you to participate in the Decade of Perfect Vision, the 2020s, and go within, spend time, um, find that still, peaceful, quiet, calm place to uh, listen to that still, small voice, to get the information, the encouragement, the inspiration, or sometimes just the quiet time, if you can find a place in nature, even if it's a, a park somewhere, find the center of that park away from all of the streets, just go deep into that aspect. I wanted to ask you, uh, Donna, Donna uh, Frankhart is my guest. She's written the book called I See Dead People. And um, I wanted to know about a little bit about your inner life as this process has begun now you were a deputy coroner for how long eight eight and a half years okay and before that 
before, well. And I guess what I really want to know is, when did you become interested in pursuing this particular area of, um, I don't know if you want to call it crime fighting or, or criminal investigation, how you want to describe that, but when did that become an interest to you? In the early 2000s, I was going through a divorce and I had two young sons. And of course, with their dad, the visitation, you know, they'd be with their dad every other weekend. And so I wanted to do something that was constructive and would help the community and would make me feel good when I didn't have my sons. And so I had heard about a team called, uh, they were cri victim crisis responders. And so I had applied for that position because I did have some medical background, not a lot, like a certified nursing uh, assistant certification. I worked up at a hospital as a um, clinical technician on the neurosurgical floor. I was a medical assistant for a little while. So I thought that this would be something that I could do. It was a volunteer position. I was interviewed. It was for five police departments. It was on, a, as I said, a, a volunteer basis. So whenever you were available, you could answer calls. Now, it was more on um, when there'd be cases, whether it was a death, death or domestic disturbance or whatever, where the police were called, the crisis responders would, would uh, go to the scene and then they'd be more there for the emotional support of the families whether it was bringing teddy bears for the children or helping to make phone calls to funeral homes, family members, um, things, things more to help the family. Mm -hmm. And so through that, I met one of the coroners in one of the counties and he had seen how I worked with families and he was uh, very impressed by that. And we started a conversation one time about uh, deputy coroners, and I'd said if he was ever considering adding on a deputy that I would be very interested. And so about a year late, uh, nine, 10 months, 11 months later, he called and he was considering adding on a deputy, but he was going to see how I did first. So I followed him on all cases for several months, about nine months. And then after he saw how I handled all of these uh, cases, which they were horrible cases, he offered me the position. I was uh, sworn in, and then I was then uh, deputy coroner. My full now this was on a part time basis, so it was always on the weekends. I would go on call from a Friday, depending on the schedule, mm -hmm. um, a Friday night and beyond twelve hour shifts. It could be a whole weekend. My full time position and career was always in travel and corporate travel. So I was doing corporate travel during the week, and then I was working as a deputy coroner on weekends. Hmm. So uh, I guess I, I should ask, uh, of the different titles of individuals, deputy coroner, coroner, and so forth, are there other titles that we're familiar with, uh, like someone who works in a morgue? Is that going to be a coroner, um, forensic scientist, that kind of thing? Where, wh what are the, some of these different names we might be familiar with? Okay, so a coroner is an elected official. A deputy coroner is hired and sworn in. People that work in funeral homes are called funeral directors. You've got the ones that do the uh, autopsies. They would be doctors. They would be forensic pathologists. Another title or name for a deputy coroner or a coroner would be our would be medical legal death investigation. We work medical legal death investigations. So you've got the medical and you've got the legal. Now we are there mainly to rule out that there was anything suspicious in the death, that they weren't, their life didn't end at the hands of another. If there isn't anything suspicious, suspicious and we don't order an autopsy, then, um, if the family does still want to know the exact cause of death, they can request an autopsy. It is at their expense. Mm -hmm. So the county that I worked in, uh, the deputies, none of us were doctors. We weren't forensic pathologists. I had one that was a paramedic and a deputy, another that was a chaplain, and then also a deputy. We had a battalion chief of, chief of the fire department and a deputy, and then myself. 
We had another one that had no medical background. Uh, he worked at a local bottling company, I think it was. So, but deputy coroner, medical legal death investigations. I'm trying to think what other titles you're. Mm. I just was curious uh, because I know that we hear these terms a lot and not really sure what they mean or who does what. And, and I, I as a matter of fact, when you brought up funeral director, um, I remember back in the uh, mid eighties, this was shortly after the uh, sweetener, the artificial sweetener equal known now as aspartame came out. And I was interviewing this gentleman uh, probably closer to the nineties, 1990. And I asked him point blank. I said, so what's, what's changed? And he says, well, uh, the one main thing that's changed is that we're using a whole lot less embalming fluid. And I said, well, why do you think that is? He says, well, uh, because uh, this new sweetener, Equal or Aspartame, turns to formaldehyde in the body. So people are basically consuming this particular sugar and they're, they're embalming themselves before they're dead, which I thought was a real interesting uh, pers- uh, you know, I, I, well, that was the strangest piece of information, but I thought, wow, you talk about, you know, committing a slow death. I mean, smokers and drug users and all of that could be deemed as they're suicidal because apparently they don't want to live because they want to put stuff in their bodies that doesn't work, you know? You just reminded me of uh, one of the funeral homes that I had gone to that did cremations and the it's called a retort and that's where the the body goes into that does the cremation Mm -hmm. and it had all of this like yellowish white substance along the outside of the up the wall and i'd asked the director what is that and he said well unfortunately because so many people are eating too much junk food and there's so much fat fat doesn't burn and people are getting larger and it's not holding in the whole body and the fat comes out and goes up the side of the wall which i just i never forgot that i thought oh and fast food and clean that because you can't leave that that's like a chimney you got to get your chimney cleaned every season before you light up a fire because of the oils that might be in the in the woods that you're burning Wow. And that's still interesting to think about from that standpoint in terms of what we're doing to ourselves as a society, uh, just from a physical standpoint, let alone mental, emotional, and spiritual. Absolutely. When you are, when you are dealing with a particular body and there are certain things that are happening And, uh, you know, we'll try not to go too far down the morbid path here, but I think that it's important to talk about these things. Um, Certainly one of the first things that most people think of when a body has been discovered and it's maybe it is foul play. Maybe it was an accident. They fell down a hill and they've been there for a little while. There is quite an aroma that comes off of that physical body due to the process of uh, decomposition Uh, is there a state in which there is little or no possibility of determining cause of death because i've heard it said that if the body's been in the water for so long as opposed to on land and in open air uh it's going to be real hard to find the cause of death or maybe the real extreme is fire Mm-hmm. Well, they're going to use dental re- and they, I, I say they, because at that point it's gone for an, the body has gone for an autopsy and you've got the pathologists and, you know, their team that are going to figure out what the cause of death was. They would go through dental records. If they don't have the dental records, and I'm trying to think because in, I was in all of the cases that I had, I didn't have any that they that we weren't able to determine what the cause of death was. So I'm sorry, I'm thinking here. That's all right. No, uh, while you're thinking, I'll let our listeners know we're talking with Donna uh, Frankart, Frankart, and she's written a book called I See Dead People. And we certainly hope that you will go to her website. And while you're thinking about that, your website is? 
I unfortunately I do not have a website yet. However, I am on Facebook mm. and Instagram. Facebook, uh, you can find me under I've Seen Dead People, Diary of a Deputy Coroner. And uh, in that group, I'm keeping up with um, the interviews and also that the book has been, it, they just completed uh, the book to screenplay adaption. It is being made for a feature film. I just saw that email, as a matter of fact. Yes, that's very exciting. And so one of the, uh, well, the owner and my publisher, owner of Jongler Books, Gary Revel, is also a filmmaker and He's an author as well. And uh, Jeff Ohm, he is the producer director. He's very well known in the film industry. He worked on many films like the Titanic, Revenant, uh, Fifth Element. There are just so many more. And so they are in talks with um, agents for A-list actors to fill the roles. I kind of went off on another direction, didn't I? <laughs> no, 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 that's fine because it's more information uh, that we were going to touch upon. What, what, what's your feeling about that? And not so much, oh, see, I wonder who would play you. Uh, but in terms of, you and I both know that movies and television, when they make films about and they get right a screenplay, they're going to take a few liberties, you know, they're going to try to excite it up a little bit. What are your thoughts about that? Are you feeling like, I, I want to make sure that they hold true to my story? Or are you going to let them, shall we say, jazz it up just a little bit for, for interest's sake? They're very, hey, I've got a great, I'm sorry? How important is that to you? It's important that I do want to uh, get the message across that I was a respectful deputy coroner and um the decedents were always the the crime scene the decedent they were always treated as i've mentioned before with respect dignity and respect and so i they like it's a they're a very good team and i was part of the consulting of the script uh, um the script adaption and so they to what truly did happen because I didn't want to be portrayed to be uh, another way, a way that I was not. Yeah. Now, are you thinking this will be uh, a feature length film, miniseries, documentary? How, how do you think this is going to unfold in that regard? Or are they going to try to sort of keep it somewhat fictional in that respect? Na and, you know, that I, you, the names have been changed to protect the, the innocent? Uh, to be honest with you, I have been so focused on the book and actually writing a sequel that I have not had the conversation with the team yet as to what direction or what plans overall that there is going to be with this film. It will be a feature film, though. Mm. I've seen Dead People. Donna uh, Frankhart is my guest, and we're talking about... Uh, her uh, work, the book that she has right now that is headed for the a theater near you somewhere down the road here. We are uh, looking forward to that. I, uh, I have actually enjoyed uh, movies, even if they were fictionalized, where they're dealing with, uh, dealing with the disembodied, like um, Ghost, I think was, was one of them with, what was that, with Patrick Swayze and, and uh, Demi Dem Moore. Demi Moore. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was a fascinating uh, 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 portrayal, if you will. Uh, whether it was from a true story or not, I don't know. I, I didn't look into it that deeply. All I know is that there are people who have had some really extraordinary um, experiences with loved ones and so forth, uh, as well as, of course, we hear quite often about couples who have been together for decades, my parents, for example, if uh, they are able to, and I think they will make it to their 70th wedding anniversary Aww. come 2026. Uh, my dad is 90, 90 years old this year, mother 87, uh, and they're still going strong, having a good time in their life. Although I sometimes, I, I will never ask them this question. But uh, it's like, what is it that keeps you going forward? I mean, what, what are your, do you still have passions that, that you want to pursue things, 
even even now, I mean, my brother bought my father a, a, an extra cycle. I don't think it was a Peloton, but it was just something he could get on and he'd cycle for about a half hour and, and then he's, he's good uh, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, I sometimes wonder, but for me, I'm hoping to live to be 100. I'm 60 now. And uh, I want to keep be I want to be able to be doing this, talking with people such as yourself about their story and about what gives them passion. What what about you? I mean, you're no longer a deputy coroner. Is that correct? That's correct. Not I, since 2015. And why did you leave that? Many reasons, uh, which I really, to be honest with you, don't want to get into at this point in time, okay. please. Um, but I, the eight and a half years uh, was, I feel, was long enough also for me working and being surrounded by death. I have a friend who is a uh, forensic pathologist, and he has uh, offered me a position working on his team. And I, I think that I think that it's time for me to move forward. Mm. I do not want to be surrounded by death anymore. I feel like there's so much more. I want happy. Not that I wasn't happy before, but I was surrounded by so much sadness and grief for so many years, and I will always be empathetic to other people and be a, want to be a caregiver and help others. But I think that um, I want to have some fun now. And I hope that I have many more years ahead. There you go. Yeah. Now, do, do, um, do you think that a lot of the platitudes that are used when someone has passed, just, you know, just shut up and be quiet and just be there with the person rather, Oh, they're in a far better place. They're no longer in pain. They're no longer suffering. Da, da, da. Something tells me that kind of stuff just doesn't really help. No, it doesn't because, and I know firsthand what it's like to lose uh, a parent or my parents, mm -hmm. a loved one. And I was not one to say, oh, well, unless they were really suffering. I mean, there were, there were situations where someone was on hospice, they were suffering. And so their end of life was actually a blessing, so to speak, because they were no longer suffering. But I wouldn't say to people, oh, he's better off. I would say that uh, him or he or she was surrounded by their angels and they'd no longer be suffering and they'll always be with you. Please uh, hold on to the wonderful memories that you had and they're, you know, watch for signs. They might try to leave you signs. But I don't think that you ever really get over losing someone. You uh, you learn to adjust to the new life without that loved one. But sometimes, uh, no matter what anybody says, it they're not better off being dead. You want them here. But then again, that's another conversation because then at, when you're saying, I don't want them to go, even though they're ready to go. Are you being selfish because you want them to stay for you, not because they're tired or um, in pain and they're ready to go? You know, that's an, it's interesting that you, you put it that way because I have often felt that the medical community in particular does such a disservice uh, to people uh, because I say that the medical community does not know when to say when. And they will just continue to try to keep this individual alive, uh, even if it's on a respirator or what a machine or what have you. And I'm not saying that it should go one way or the other. There's no hard and fast rule. Every single case is different. It's, it's unique. It's personal. But at the same time, there has to come a point at which the medical community says, look, We've done all we can. The only thing left is quantity of life, not quality. Right. And I'll tell you what, that's what I want is qu quality. If I don't make it to 100, okay. I'm not supposed to make it to 100. If I do, I will be excited as all get out. I hope I go even further beyond that. Uh, as long as I stay, and I'm going to do everything I can to keep myself healthy. 
Now you mentioned something in terms of the the crema, crematoriums uh, at, at various uh, at the at the uh, uh, um, funeral homes and so forth, the mortuaries um, that are showing signs that we are just not taking care of ourselves. Um, when you share that kind of news with people, does it tend sort of to open their eyes or, or do you share that with them <laughs> other than here on this program? Have you never shared that before? Uh, Cause you don't want to, you don't want to creep people out. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't think I've mentioned that before. <laughs> I think I have it in the book, but it's not, I mean, within family, it might've come up at one point in time, but I don't, because I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want people to think I'm being judgmental, like people that smoke cigarettes. I don't mean you should quit smoking. You know, they know they shouldn't be smoking or whatever other things, yeah. vices that they have. I don't want to be judgmental, but um, so no, I don't have that conversation too often. I don't, and I don't want to bad mouth the fast food industry. Right. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> Have you, as the deputy coroner, have you ever had to um, notify next of kin? Is that is that a part of the pro of the duties of a, a deputy coroner? Yes, uh, depending on uh, the case, the circumstances. Many times we would now, depending who found the body, it might be a family member that finds their loved one or the decedent, or it could be a neighbor. Um, so family has, has found the body, then of course, you know, they're going to be reaching out to all of their loved ones. Right. But otherwise, yeah, there were times when as a deputy coroner, I would have to notify the family, go to their home. Uh, sometimes if they weren't in the area, we'd have to call them on the phone to advise them that their loved one had passed away. And then there were also cases where the police would go. I'd be, because the body is controlled by the coroner, the deputy coroner, the crime scene, uh, the police have control of the actual scene, the crime scene, but the body was our responsibility. So you couldn't leave the body once you were there. So then the police would go and notify the family while we completed our duties of examining, drawing fluids for toxicology, and all of the, the protocol that we went through, we'd stay with the body. How much can be done in the field and how much has to be done in a more sterile environment like the morgue? What, at least speaking for myself, uh, in the county that I worked in, the pronounce the time of death, we do take the photos, draw fluids for toxicology, whether it was blood, urine, or vitreous, vitreous is from the eye. Mm. If you need, if there needed to be more testing done or to uh, a more involved investigation or determination of what the actual cause was, and it was suspicious, then the body would be sent to the morgue for the pathologist or the medical assist, uh, medical examiner, which is another name, if it's a forensic pathologist that would do the autopsy, and then they would do the full post or autopsy and x-rays and did you ever um when you were growing up uh did you ever think that this would be something that even though it's only for a short eight years uh that you'd ever be doing that you'd be handling the remains of uh other human beings did that ever cross your mind back then never i was always fat never <laughs> As a matter of fact, I didn't even, I, death scared me. Horror films, uh, the last one and probably the only one I really saw was The Exorcist. And when did that come out? That was like way back. Oh, yeah. I was always fascinated in, with the medical field and I always was fascinated with law enforcement. Um, so it's kind of a combination of both. No, I never, ever, ever thought that I'd be working or with death or around dead people. But I felt like if I could help the families, well, actually the decedent, because we were the voice when they could no longer speak, and to at least be present for the families that had just gone through losing a loved one in a very tragic way, and to 
show them that I was compassionate and that their lo- that their loved one meant some something and they weren't treated just as a body that was dead, you know, on the side of the road or in a building or wherever, then that was all that I needed to feel like I, I had done what I was meant to do. They weren't roadkill. No, no, no. And the thing is that, you know, I never wanted to be that one that didn't look at them as a human being, that it was just a job. And it was like, okay, let's get this investigation. I'm not saying people are like that. Sure, there might be out there, but I never lost sight that that was someone that had a life that had a a mother or a father, was a mother, father, sister, brother. Mm. We're talking with uh, Donna uh, Frankart, and we're talking about her book, I've seen dead people. You can go to her Facebook page, I've seen dead people, and uh, find out more about her, as well as the feature length movie that will be coming out sometime down the road here. We don't know when. They're still working on uh, a lot of the particulars. So uh, just uh, keep in mind, it'll be out soon. I don't know if Tom Hanks will be in it or not. It could happen. But uh, I do know that uh, uh, the subject of death and dying has always fascinated me from the standpoint of someone having passed away and then wondering what they're experiencing now. What are they going through? What about you? What did I experience? Well, what, I'm sorry. What, what are your thoughts about the decedents? Uh, have, uh, Cause for me, it was, I wonder what, like when Michael Jackson passed away. Okay. And I didn't know all the details, didn't need to. All I know is they pronounced him dead. I wondered, What is he doing now? What is he experiencing? You know, because I personally believe that we are immortal. That which animates the physical body is immortal. So now I'm going, what is he doing? This was before my life between lives experience. What about you? Did you ever contemplate that? Was ever a thought? Oh, yes. Yes, it was. Uh, First off, when I get to the crime scene, it's like putting a puzzle together because you're stepping into someone's life. Uh, trying to figure out what happened in the last so many hours of their life. Checking to see, you know, they might have their dinner on the stove or they might have been getting ready for bed. So you're thinking about what was their life like and what brought them to this? What happened? What happened to you? And then once you get past that and you do the investigation, then it's, I wonder what was going through their mind. I hope they didn't suffer. I wonder if they're here with me right now. There are many times I could feel them that they were, I could feel them in the room. Uh, There's one particular case that I went on and is, it is in the book, (laughs) but um, she was absolutely in the room with me and she did get her message out to me to let me know that she was there. And then, yes, I would think, okay, are they, is that person watching me right now? Are they, afraid are they at peace have they left the building you know and they're (laughs) have have they left the building and they've already they're going through their transitioning are they with their loved ones so many things went through my mind as to what they did before they died what were they doing right at that moment and where were they going Mm. it is fascinating to consider those possibilities the other part that troubles me about these kinds of situations is the lost potential. Does that ever run through your mind when you, now that let's say the investigators, I don't know how much information you're ever given by the investigators of the actual crime and the individual's history and so forth, uh, but what they could have accomplished had they lived, had they not been taken out that way or what have you. I thought that all weighed heavily on my mind as well. As a matter of fact, I mentioned it in the book of especially the younger people thinking there's the poor family that are now never going to experience being grandparents. They've lost their child. There's never going to be the weddings. You know, I even, even now, if I'm out at a store, I'm somewhere where there's other people and I look at them and I'll wonder What's going to happen in their future? Are they going to have much of a future? Are they going to die young? Are they, you know, it's always going through my head, yeah. my mind. And yes, the, the lost opportunities and the lost experiences that these 
decedents will no longer have. Now, I don't know if there are any statistics on this, but this question has been raised over the course of time uh, here in, in the very station I work, but elsewhere, I'm sure. Having to do with the forms of uh, trans transition that people go through. A lot of people, you've talked about this, about how, and my grandmother, for example, on my mother's side of the family, she passed in her sleep. Um, I had a dear friend, uh, my present wife and I had a dear friend who passed away. I say he passed away in our home uh, because she did try to revive him. They were able to at least get him on, get him resuscitated to the extent they had him on a ventilator, but that didn't mean he ever regained consciousness um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. So the statistics I'm curious about are though the percentage of those who pass peacefully and quietly and calmly as opposed to those in a very dramatic form, such as what you have had to deal with in the eight years you were a deputy deputy coroner. Any, do you have any information on that? I actually don't, but I'm going to be researching that now because that's a good question. Yeah, because I know a <laughs> um, lot of us, we think about that. Well, I, I mean, I've shared, I think I shared with you in our, our pre-conversation about uh, my life between lives experience where I was in my, my past life, the last one before this one. And I walked out of my cabin and I sat down in my chair, leaned the chair back, put my feet up on the rails, tipped my hat back and said, man, it's been a good life. And I just left the body. Now, whether I knew how or not, all I know is I just, I just left. And boy, wouldn't that be nice just to choose the time of our departure, of our what? trading in the old for the new, so to speak. Wouldn't it? But then you wonder, would you want to know when your expiration date was? I don't think I would. Well, I'm not saying that we would know per se. No. Uh, we, we, are, we are given a ticket and we know our arrival date. We just don't know the departure date and time. Right. And I don't know that I'd want to know that either necessarily. Um, but by the same token, what I'm, of course, referring to is that moment at which, okay, I'm ready. And I've said this before. I do. I want to make it to 100. But if I don't, that's fine. And if today is my day, and of course, I'm hoping it's not. But if it were, I'm good to go. Is there more I want to do? Absolutely, there's more I want to do. But I am not going to uh, rush through. I'm, I'm a firm believer in uh, divine right timing, if you will. The universe knows how things are supposed to flow. There, the universe, as I say it, I, you know, the universe asks the questions on this program. I'm just along for the ride. So if this universe says, you know what, you have accomplished what you set out to accomplish, it's time for you to come home, so to speak, uh, to prepare for the next level of your journey, you know, of existence, which we're immortal. You know, we as individuals, I believe, and I'm curious about your perspective. Do you believe that we are immortal? I do. And the same as you, I think that if it was my time, I'm at peace with it. I'm ready to go. I wouldn't want to leave my, my, my children, my sons, my, my grandchildren, but I do think we are immortal. And I think that it's, now I need to read more up on that, <laughs> this, yeah. but I do believe that we just continue on to the next, the transition into the next realm, our energy, our souls continue on. Oh boy, that's that. See, that's the thing. That's another subject. Is are we reincarnated into other bodies? Mm. Are we just a ball of energy? The next level that we just kind of swirl around, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's it. And and granted, there are those who will tell you they know. OK, from their own experiences. And I'm not going to disagree with them. By the same token, they know for themselves, but they don't know for me. And I might believe I love what Greg Braden said to us on a program not long ago when we were talking about his book, The uh, Healing Power of Belief, said that there will come a day when we will no longer believe we will know. 
Um, and that may happen to us as we go through our lives, but we can only know for ourselves. We can't know for other people or for the rest of the population. We can only know for us. Uh, right. That's why there is a certain element of truth to the fact that, you know, you have your truth and I have mine. Uh, only from that standpoint of our own personal experiences. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but I, I believe there's something after this. If there isn't, I'm not going to know anyway, am I? You know, <laughs> if it's lights out, I'm not going to know. Right. So, but, geez, with all of these spirits that have been around me, I, exactly. I can't deny it. Something, something happens after you die. Yeah. Something's going on because yeah. like I said, and I, I have pictures and I, like I said, my sons have seen and experienced. So how do you deny that? Exactly. How do you argue that? We're talking with Donna Frankart and she has got a book out entitled, I've seen dead people. Well, I love the, I love the book cover. Although you know, you, you. you took a big risk there with uh, taking a picture from the bottom of the feet. And if that if that cloth isn't positioned right, you're going to expose a whole lot more than those feet <laughs> in the toe tag. But anyway, uh, that's the cover of the book, I've Seen Dead People. You can go to her Facebook page, I've Seen Dead People, and uh, find out more about her, as well as uh, keep up on the, uh, the uh, uh, unfolding events regarding a, a, a possible movie that will be coming out sometime in the near future, we hope. Uh, and looking forward to maybe talking with you then about that experience, because that alone, you're going to end up, re you know, I'm sure that you're going to be the consultant because it's your book, obviously, transformed into a screenplay. And you're going to be reliving some of those experiences. What, what are your thoughts about going back and reliving some of those items that are in the book? That's another good question. <laughs> I, <laughs> when I first started doing, when my book was published, which was published in February, Jongler Books, Gary Revel, and I didn't really think it out that I'd be talking about death. I have a lot of scars that are still in internal inside me from experiencing all of the yeah. the tragedy that I that I you know was hands on and surrounded by. But honestly, I'm finding that the more that I talk about it, it's almost healing for me because I had to keep that all in. I had that all inside of me for so many years. Uh, because that's just not something you talk about, you know, over the dinner table or yeah. chatting with friends about uh, what you've seen or witnessed. People don't want to hear that. And I didn't want to scare anyone. But in looking back and the more I talk about it, I think, wow, my life was kind of scary. <laughs> not scary, but I, I saw things that I hope that people don't ever have to see in their lifetime. Because it's not the same when you see it on the screen as it is when you're there and right in real life with death around you. Yeah. And you, uh, you uh, used an interesting phrase there. And I'm curious uh, as to the number of children that you have had to um, oversee in these uh, post-mortem uh, states and how that has affected you. And that's, I'm guessing that's probably one area of the scars, if you will, the trauma that you experienced. So because, uh, and, 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 you know, um, that's, that, that has to have been very, very difficult, being, especially being a mother. Very difficult. I have one of the stories in the book. It's uh, one that really uh, affected me very deeply because it was a case on Mother's Day. Oh. And it involved it involved a child. So uh, very difficult, especially, uh, again, when you're hands on, and you have a little life that has hasn't even really begun. And you're holding this child and you can feel the coldness of the body because that child is gone. And just, uh, you wonder, you ask, you ask, why? I asked this so many times, why, why God? 
Why have you not, why has this child not had the chance to live and you're already taking him or her away? You know, how, how does this happen? That that's another one that would be a discussion I'd love to have sometime. Yeah. Well, and that also raises the next part of a question you've just, you've, you managed to address it before I ask it, uh, which is just fine. And that is your relationship with God in reference to all of this, you know, you, you've already stated, you, you sit there and you're holding this, this child who's gone, the cold body. Why, God? Why? Uh, you, still, you still have a fairly good connected relationship with God, or is it pretty strained because God hasn't taken care of, especially the least of these, the children? I have a very close relationship with God. It has never faltered. I pray daily. Um, I do believe in all, as long as you're a good person, you're a good Christian. I don't care what denomination you are, as long as you believe in the higher power and, and you're a good person and you're, you're good to your fellow man, then, uh, that's what's most important to me. But I, I still don't know the answer to that, why the young ones and the children have to go if it's just that. They were needed in the next realm. I've heard that too, that God decided or whomever decided that they needed to be somewhere else for, for another family or whatever happens after the transition. Um, I do, and I had been told that, again, going back to the mediums, because I had so many spirits or I had spirits attaching to me because I was actually doing the... And this is what they told me, a couple of them, the work of God in that on earth, in that I was there to care for the ones that lost their lives and to do it in a way that they always did have their dignity and care for them with my heart involved. It's hard to, to explain, but I just have always felt God close to me and I would pray to God because with the spirits and you know, there's the evil entities and whatever else is going on out there. I don't even want to talk about that touch on that. I don't want it to be anywhere near me. Right. Um, so I will continue to pray and think of only the goodness and, and God being close by. So, so you've, you've, uh, you pray and you've asked God why, but you've never blamed God Do I admit it? <laughs> <They were, laughs> okay, okay. So a couple of times I faltered and I said, God, why? Actually, not, yes, about somebody losing their life, but also for me, things that were happening throughout the years. God, why? Why, why, are you, why is this happening to me? Was I that bad? Am I being taught a lesson? Was I really a, a you-know-what in my life before that, that this is payback time? <laughs> but that those were always just short, you know, and short you, bouts. Yeah. You used the term caregiver. Uh, I was for a period of time back in the early 2000s. Um, do you feel that maybe, especially when dealing with the, the bodies of children, that maybe that's why you were there for them, for the children? Maybe that was the why, at least as far as your being present in that moment, not necessarily why this child had to die, but why you had to be there. Yes, I believe that. And I was there for, uh, to comfort the parents the family, the loved ones that were left behind that lost this little child, to hug them, to sit with them, talk talk with them, try to comfort them in any way. Of Although, how do you comfort someone that has just lost a child? You know, when you're, you're notifying them or you're, you're telling them that, like, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, car fatalities where teenagers would be, they'd be brought to the hospital and then the family, the parents or the family would be called to the hospital for notification. Now, all they knew was that their child had been in a car accident and they were at the hospital. 
they didn't know that their child had died yet. And so, and that was, I think that was more difficult than the case itself because I, I have, I, I'm haunted by visually thinking of some of these parents that they sat across from me, <clears throat> excuse me, sat across from me and what I was about to tell them was going to shatter them. And just that look of the deer in the headlights look of, of I've just, like I said, totally shattered them, their lives. And then to walk with them down the corridor to, to their, their child that is dead or has passed away in one of the rooms, very difficult. Yeah. But I tried to comfort them in any way that I could, although they probably didn't remember me, my name, my face, but hopefully somewhere in their, in their memory, they will remember that there was someone there that did show that they cared. Yeah. Yeah. This subject of transitioning is a, a difficult one for probably the majority of human beings on the planet. Uh, in spite of the fact that, and I've been to the uh, population counter website, if you will, and I have uh, watched the numbers of births and deaths, and the births outnumber the deaths, which is rather interesting in spite of the numbers that we see of people, whether it's from natural causes or viruses or man-made disasters and, and conflicts and so forth. Uh, our population is, at last count, at approximately 7.8 billion. 7.8 billion. And yet the population continues to grow. Uh, and um, it's, it's just really very interesting to me uh, when I hear people almost complaining about how the population growth rate is slowing. And so for some reason, that's a bad thing. You know, I'm thinking, isn't it supposed to kind of ebb and flow? I mean, aren't there cycles even in, in population growth, that kind of thing? And nine times out of 10, especially in our modern age, the, the population concerns over population growth, and if it slows, have more to do with money and economics than they have to do with uh, the interest in uh, the compassion for the human race as a whole, you know. Uh, right. Some even talk about how this planet is really only designed to hold maybe three or four billion. So we're already okay. almost double uh, what we should be. And I'm sitting here going, well, okay, how do you, how do you determine that? <laughs> you know, I mean, because there are some areas of this planet where there are hardly any people at all. And, and the area is still livable. You know, I'm not talking right. about the Sahara desert, although there are nomads who live in that area. So it's, just, it's a very interesting conversation to have. It's rather complex, there's no question about it. And we all, as my father said, we're all uh, going to die. Nobody gets out of this world alive. That's just the nature of things here. Uh, and uh, we just we need to come to grips with that, that reality. The question is, uh, how are we going to uh, live our lives in the meantime? What kind of, you know, talk about legacy. What kind of a legacy do you think that you are leaving? I mean, and, you're, and quite honestly, your work is not done because you're still here. I'm hoping that, and I would say, and I have on Facebook, there's that I've seen dead people group, but then I also have another group that's called Delightful Deputy Donna dash small C crazy coroner. <laughs> so I'm just a little crazy. <laughs> and I do remind people, I'm hoping that I can connect souls throughout the world or whomever will listen to enjoy and embrace life, spend time with their loved ones, look after their elderly, their neighbors, uh, don't focus everything on anything, uh, everything being materialistic or monetary that make memories, leave your footprints so that between the date of birth and the date of death that you fill that fill that color color that canvas and like you said leave your legacy so i'm hoping that in my small way i can get the message to people to not fear death because death is a scary thing it's taboo people don't want to talk about it even though we're all going to die like you said 
Exactly. And so if I can bring comfort to people in any way to not fear death and, um, and, and embrace, as I said, embrace life and every breath that you take, then I'll feel like I've done my job, so to speak. Well, I, I, we really do appreciate the job that uh, you have done, not only as the deputy coroner for eight years, but also in terms of sharing it with us through I've Seen Dead People. That's the title of the book available. You can go through, I'm sure it's available on Amazon. You can also Amazon find about, about Donna through uh, Facebook, her Facebook page, I've Seen Dead People. And uh, we certainly hope that you will do that. I would venture too that there will be a, there will be a, um, uh, a website probably one of these days as well to, to uh, have available the links to the book, to the movie, uh, to other things that you might be doing. And what are you doing now, by the way? A lot of interviews. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm also, I started on the sequel, the next book. It's a continuation. I have more to say. I have a lot to say. Is this uh, title, volume two, same title, volume two? I'm going to switch the title a little bit, but volume two, yes. Okay. So we'll have to I haven't, that title. And uh, we'll, I haven't we'll quite decided there. yet. Yeah. Excuse me? I said, and when you do, we'll have you back on to talk about that uh, installment, if you will. Oh, I would love that. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a subject we're going to continue to talk about here on Tell Me Your Story. We've been talking today with Donna Frankhart, author of uh, I See, I've Seen Dead People. It's the title of her, uh, her book, available via Amazon. Also, as I mentioned, on her Facebook page. We certainly hope that you will uh, uh, make the effort to go to that Facebook page and find out more. Go to Amazon and get a copy of the book. I think you'll be quite interested, as well as uh, listen to these programs, Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. The uh, podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, and other locations that you folks are reposting. And thank you for doing that. And uh, if you uh, resonate with what we've been talking about on this or any other program and you'd like to support us and be a part of the work that we are doing, we have a PayPal and Patreon account for your security as well as ours. And we would greatly appreciate any amount uh, that you uh, would be able to support us with. And we also encourage you to participate in the decade of perfect vision, the 2020. Spend that time going within, listening to that still small voice and and just finding that quiet, peaceful place to just relax and rejuvenate. And we hope that you will do that. We do have a three final questions we like to ask each one of our guests. You may have addressed it during the interview. I like to ask it straight on. And the first of those three questions is, who is Donna Frankhart? Donna Frankhart is a person that loves mankind that wants to bring goodness into life and be a good person to my neighbor. Uh, I want to be a good mother, a good role model to the community. And uh, Donna Frankhart is ready for many more adventures in her life. <laughs> She's, um, I'm sorry, that probably wasn't the best <laughs> answer. Oh. That's, that's just fine. Second question is, what is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? I, what I would like to accomplish or achieve is to get the word out to anybody that will listen to me that I have worked with death firsthand. I have felt the spirits and seen the spirits and to not fear death that death is part of life and there is more to death than dying and to embrace every moment of life that they are here and alive on earth and to love, love and take care of uh, their family, their loved ones, their friends. And, and finally, what is your life's purpose? My life's my Number one life's purpose was to, <clears throat> excuse me, be a good mother 
and to continue being a good mother to which I did and raised two wonderful sons to be uh, good human beings. And my life's purpose is to help man, help my fellow man, which I know I gave that answer before, but I just want to be remembered as someone that was, uh, had a good heart and a good soul and um, respected every other human being that I came in contact with. Well, Donna, Donna Frankhart, I thank, uh, I thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's been a great pleasure to have an opportunity to talk with you and to get your message out, get your word out about the work that you're doing, especially through the book, I've Seen Dead People. Again, available on Amazon. Go to Facebook, I've Seen Dead People. And uh, we, again, thank you so much and look forward to having you back thank when you, Richard. Uh, volume two comes out. Thank you, Richard. It was my pleasure. And I thank you for listening and watching. Tell me your story, New Paradigms for a New World. I certainly hope that you will subscribe either to the podcasts or to the video cast on YouTube. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lull.